Hi, epistemologists. So we've come to that time. It is time to talk about epistemic injustice. It's the moment in our class when our epistemic concepts that have so far been isolated from the moral world suddenly become entangled in society and issues having to do with people in different positions of power and with people interacting in a landscape that now includes social relations, besides the simple relationship of conversational partner. So today I have asked you to read two chapters from Miranda Fricker's book on epistemic injustice. And in this book, philosopher Miranda Fricker argues that there are distinctively epistemic kinds of injustice. And what does this mean, epistemically distinctive? What that means is that we're not just talking about harming someone in terms of depriving them of goods or services. Those are sort of the traditional ways of understanding injustice. I'm doing you a harm because or I'm withholding from you some important food or shelter resources or maybe healthcare resources, things that you need, goods or services that you need in order to be fulfilled as a human being. So we're not talking about, even though we're talking about epistemic injustice, for Fricker, we're not talking about epistemic resources such as information or education because those are still objects that have been accounted for in theories of justice. What we're talking about is harming someone in a different way. It's harming someone in their capacity as a knower. And Fricker thinks she's identified two ways in which we might harm someone in their capacity as a knower call these, first of all, testimonial injustice. We'll talk about it in a minute. And secondly, hermeneutical injustice. We'll also talk about it in a minute. So let's start with testimonial injustice. Suppose that you are, you know, seated in a group of people and you are the one person in the group from a minority community. And your minority community is social, in the social environment you're in tends to be taken less seriously than other minority communities. You're stereotyped um, as, I don't know, not being as smart as, as somebody else, as not being as assertive as somebody else. Or maybe you're stereotyped as um, claiming to know more than you know or something like that. Now, if you're in such a group and you try to speak up, one thing that stereotypically happens, and again, I'm just speaking stereotypically here, I'm trying to be as general as possible. Stereotypically, the group will take less seriously the utterances made by someone from that stereotyped minority community. So when that individual from the minority community tries to give testimony, tries to say, hey, this is the way things are, or hey, this is my opinion about this issue, or hey, I think we should conduct this scientific experiment a different way, or hey, I think we need to pay attention to this bit of evidence, all of those kinds of assertions, they might suffer what Fricker calls testimonial injustice. And what that is, is taking less seriously the testimony of someone from a certain group because of their belonging in that group. That kind of thing, testimonial injustice, harms someone, according to Fricker, in their capacity as a giver of knowledge. It's an intrinsic injustice done to that person. Ultimately, Fricker thinks that if that harm goes deep, it can prevent someone from becoming who they are. You know, maybe a promising young person um, becomes disaffected from mathematics, even though they could have been really, really good at mathematics because every time they try to answer a question in math class, they get ignored in favor of some other student. Maybe somebody who was smart enough and uh, hardworking enough to get all the way to a competitive graduate program gets undermined by their peers all of the time because they're from a minority group and they end up feeling like they're not as capable as the other members of the group and so they end up quitting. Those are two stories that we sometimes hear if that harm goes really deep for that person, if that testimonial injustice goes very deep, it can prevent these people from realizing their full potential. And that's the sense in which 
Fricker thinks that this is a harm to someone in their capacity as a knower. In this case, testimonial injustice harms their capacity as a giver of knowledge, or if you like, a producer of knowledge. You might be able to think of your own examples. Um, you might think of examples from films, TV shows, plays, real life. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time today going over real life examples because I think that they're easy and apparent. But one thing that's important to note is that uh, it is required for Fricker's view that there be something systematic about this kind of injustice. So remember that part of the definition of testimonial injustice is taking someone less seriously because they belong to a particular group. We do, as a matter of fact, often make assessments of how truthful someone might be or how trustworthy someone might be, whether we should pay attention to them or not. Are they, do they have a level of expertise that we recognize? We have to make all of those judgments all the time because you know there's so many people making claims on our attention and usually we have to be able to rank people in terms of how promising they are in terms of giving us reliable accurate information and some people are straight up liars and some people don't know what they're talking about and some people don't read the things that they claim to read and so on and so forth or some people get their information from unreliable sources so just because we take someone's testimony less seriously doesn't necessarily mean we're committing an, a testimonial injustice however if we tend to take less seriously the testimony of someone because they're from a particular group that that means that we are committing a testimonial injustice more commonly, it'll be the case that testimonial injustices are systematic things. They're not things that like a particularly bad or negligent person does to another well-intentioned person. It's something that's perpetuated by a system where many people maybe continuously treat someone from a particular group as less serious, less expert, less well-informed than, than people from other groups. So, this is all just to say testimonial injustice, the kind that we want to analyze today, comes from systematic injustice. It's not just a one time kind of like, I don't want to take you seriously, I'm tired, or I don't think you've done the reading kind of thing. What's important to find out is whether or not that attitude is coming from a place of judging the person's belongingness to a group. Maybe that judgment could be implicit, you know, we're not always aware of of how we're biased towards others. But we should be concerned about testimonial injustice, not just because it's harmful to people who are in a community when they're trying to speak and be a participant um, in like normal contexts, which is a big deal, but also because there are many contexts in which people's testimony has more power. And if we don't take their testimony seriously, we're risking greater dangers to both themselves and to us as a, as a society, right? If you don't have, uh, if you don't take seriously the opinions of women when you're studying women, you know what happens? You get a book like A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. <laughs> um, if you don't take seriously the opinions of black people about what's going on in the United States uh, with police brutality, then you might be ignoring an important piece of information uh, that is pertinent to how society is functioning, to put it very, very broadly. So naturally, the injustice, in this case testimonial injustice, suggests a kind of solution. How do you fix testimonial injustice? Well, in a way, it's kind of easy. Just take more seriously people from communities that you tend not to take seriously treat them as epistemic peers more often than you do. <laughs> if you find out that a system is committing testimonial injustice, try to make sure that it corrects for that by increasing the attribution of authority um, that it gives to people from marginalized groups. Now let's talk about a second injustice that uh, Fricker talks about. And this second injustice is hermeneutical injustice. Hermeneutical injustice is harm to a person or group of people by virtue of making inarticulable or hard to understand some aspects of their social experience due to their marginalization. 
This harm is typically not perpetrated, according to Fricker, by individuals. So it's not something that like I do to you or that you do to someone else. Instead, it's supposed to be a gap in our collective hermeneutical resources, in our shared tools of social interpretation. For example, it's fairly recent that we've developed in American society a concept of sexual harassment. There was a time when we didn't have a concept of sexual harassment. And so if you were experiencing that kind of harassment in the workplace, you wouldn't have had the words to describe what was happening to you or to explain to someone else or to convey to someone else why it was harmful. And that is a kind of harm that you're suffering as a knower. There's, there's sort of an inability that you would have to know what's up with your own situation, what's incorrect, what, what is harmful to you about that situation, even though you would have a very real sense that you're being harmed. You wouldn't be able to express it even to yourself. So it's not a harm that somebody's doing to you. You know, no one's, no one's saying, aha, you don't have a concept of sexual harassment because I'm keeping it from you. It's a harm that exists because our epistemic tools aren't up to the task of helping you kind of move forward in the world. Being marginalized uh, in certain ways with certain labels in a culture where the concepts that those labels pick out are inherently negative can also be a way to marginalize people. So think about gay pride, for example. Why call it pride? Some people have asked in the past. Well, it's because the idea of being gay, of being attracted to people of your same sex or of being attracted in non-heteronormative ways to others, queer pride, or to be, uh, to express a kind of gender identity that is non-typical or non-heteronormative or non-binary, all of those ways, the words for those things were often tied together very strongly with a negative connotation. And so there was almost no way for you to express if you have that identity to say, you know, I'm queer, and to have someone hear that as something that wasn't a negative assertion. The word queer, for example, was, was riddled with connotation. Same thing for the word gay, same thing for the word disabled. And so people in these communities have developed the concept of disability pride, of gay pride, of queer pride, as a way of taking back concepts that were inhibiting the ability to say the positive things that they were feeling about their own identity. Uh, disability pride, for example, is a relatively recent development and it enables people who have disabilities to say that their experience is a happy and a good one. I'm proud to be disabled. I'm proud to be a person who has this condition because I'm actually able to enjoy my life. And the concept of disability, you might think, carries with it a connotation that sounds inherently negative. So if you were to tell someone in the English language, I'm happy to be disabled, they look at you kind of strange because the, the connotation of the word disabled doesn't sound like it's something you should be happy about unless you're like, but the concept of pride, what it's doing is it hermeneutically changes the situation. So now you can make assertions and hopefully be understood um, in making those assertions and conveying something that you were previously not able to convey about your own experience. So even though, you know, the two examples are, well, various examples that I've given include examples of not having a concept for something negative, like sexual harassment, and not having a concept for something positive, like disability pride, both of those ways of lacking concepts for describing your own experience can be hermeneutically harmful. Hermeneutics here coming from the word for interpretation, right? So you don't have concepts for interpreting your experiences and communicating your experiences to others. Now that we have these two concepts in hand, testimonial injustice and hermeneutical injustice, why do we want them? Why do we need them? What good are they? Why not throw them out the window? Well, according to Miranda Fricker, having these categories, first of all, discourages reductionism. 
we can actually distinguish, Fricker thinks, between rejecting someone's testimony for good reason and rejecting it out of mere prejudice. So even though our reasoning is influenced by social forces, not all of our reasoning is swamped by social forces. So just because we now have these concepts doesn't mean that every single interaction we have is now going to be swamped out by considerations of justice and injustice, epistemically speaking. So here's Fricker. We should ask, quote, first order ethical questions in the context of socially situated accounts of our epistemic practices, unquote. So basically, this account conceives participants as operating as social types who stand in relations of power to one another. We can then trace, quote, some of the interdependencies of power, reason, and epistemic authority, unquote. So having these concepts of mind, we can now talk about who has power, who is attributed to authority, who has reason in their, in their possession, what is reason, and what does this have to do with society and with first order ethics? What's good or bad about this situation, about who has power, like the power to attribute epistemic authority to someone? So in order to talk about these issues a little bit more deeply, it might be important to talk a little bit about the concept of social power. What is social power? The core idea is the following. Power is a socially situated capacity to control others' actions. So when we talk about social power, we can be talking about either power that specific agents, specific people have, or we could be talking about power inherent in the social or institution, the, the social structures or the institutions of our society, like government, for example, churches or educational institutions. Um, but we can talk about social power being one or the other or both. So social power is the more general feature that is, in a sense, shared by agents and structures that allows agents and structures to control the actions of people in that society. Fricker thinks, um, and she takes some of this from Foucault and other social thinkers, that a subspecies of social power is identity power. So identity power, she thinks, is directly dependent on, quote, shared social imaginative conceptions of the social identities of those implicated in the particular operation of power, unquote. Compare identity power, this power of the conception of what sort of people we are and how we are implicated in the power relationships with material power. So you could have power in terms of your identity in social space, what other people think about you and what you think about yourself and how you're situated in social space. And we can compare that with your actual material power. Now, both are kinds of power, but your material power comes from what you have possession of, like what objects are in your possession and what goods are in your possession, how much money you have, how many degrees are hung up on your wall, that kind of thing. So how much tangible good you have versus how much power the concept of you as a figure or as a person who's a member of a community gives you in, in a society. And sometimes these come together and sometimes they come apart. One example that you can think of probably very quickly is the idea of an influencer. So in the modern day, we have these things, <laughs> call them influencers. Um, they're like social media stars and their literal social power, their, their visibility in society, the concept that we have of them as important, if you like, also tends to come with, is very closely associated with material power, which is why so many people are trying to become influencers because it's, it's, it's a very easy way to convert social power into material power. <laughs> but sometimes the opposite happens. If you have material power and you get on social media, you tend to accrue social power on social media. <laughs> it's funny how that works, isn't it? Hmm. For Fricker, power is always structural. For Foucault though, power is more like a net and individuals circulate among it and both undergo and exercise power. So they have different views about what exactly social power is, but we won't get into the details today. 
So let's talk a little bit more in deeply about testimonial injustice for a minute, uh, just, just as a passing example um, and a focus for some of Fricker's very helpful analysis. The main dysfunction that we might identify in testimonial injustice and in testimonial practice can come from either what Fricker calls a credibility excess or from what she calls a credibility deficit. So what happens is that you as a hearer, whenever you hear anybody give you information, you always have to make some attribution of credibility to the speaker. You know, there's a regular situation in which someone comes up to me and says, oh, hey, there's a discount at the supermarket. You should go and buy some cheap chocolates. And I'd be like, oh, great. I really want to know about that. I'm going to go to the grocery store. And if I go to the grocery store and the chocolates aren't discounted, I'll be really upset. <laughs> I might think, oh, I... I shouldn't give that person that much credibility anymore. And next time they tell me there's a sale, I'm not gonna listen to that person, right? So at every moment, I'm sort of making an attribution of credibility. I'm just not always thinking about it. In that case, I was thinking that they were credible and I realized that maybe I was thinking they were too credible. So what happens with testimonial injustice is that I attributed them too little credibility a lot of the time. But Fricker points out, Testimonial injustice can also occur when I give a person who doesn't deserve as much credibility an excess of credibility. I take someone too seriously who doesn't deserve to be taken seriously. But is this an example of testimonial injustice? What do you think? You might think of some examples here. Sometimes there are people in public spaces that parade as experts who are not experts um, and claim to be able to tell people the solutions to problems that they actually can't tell them the solutions to. And because people attribute those people credibility, they might be misattributing credibility to someone who actually does deserve to get credibility. And if it's because of how they belong to a particular group, like suppose that you're taking the white guy really seriously because he's white and he has a beard and he's older and so that automatically makes you think that he's small, smarter than other people. That would maybe undermine the testimony of other people in the same field who maybe are more qualified than that person but don't have a white beard. That's just an example. Um, and unfortunately, it's one that, that has happened. I'm not saying that it happens in every case. We don't take just any, any white person seriously, but it does happen that we think older white men are more credible for some reason. Now, Fricker isn't analyzing what that reason is. We're just analyzing whether or not it happens and whether or not it happening is a good or a bad thing. On her opinion, attributing too much credibility to somebody, that might be unjust. In the same way that giving a person more than they deserve for a job that they have done can be unjust, especially when resources are limited. That gets you to ask maybe this question. This is a take home question for you. Is credibility a limited resource? Can you give equal credibility to everybody or is it necessary that you have credibility allocated asymmetrically? That is to say, so that some people get more of it and some people get less of it. Is credibility finite, I guess, is what I'm asking. According to Fricker, quote, there is no puzzle about the fair distribution of credibility, for credibility is a concept that wears its proper distribution on its sleeve, unquote. She thinks it's just kind of automatic. You should know who deserves credibility for what. If someone is credible, they get credibility. If someone's not credible, they don't get credibility. And then it's just a matter of whether or not I can tell, right? So here she is again, quote, the injustice we are aiming to track down is not to be characterized as non-receipt of one's fair share of a good credibility, as this would fail to capture the distinctive respect in which the speaker is wrong. So when I'm over attributing credibility to someone, it's not necessarily that somebody who gets the regular amount of credibility is wronged because they've received the amount that they deserved or something like that. The other reason is that credibility excess doesn't wrong the person we are attributing too much credibility to in their capacity as a knower, right? Although it might be inconvenient sometimes for other reasons. But basically what matters is when, when we are 
making the mistake of not attributing enough credibility to someone. So if you're getting the right amount of credibility, but I'm giving someone else too much credibility, Fricker cares less about that situation. Although there is something wrong with it systematically, it's not a harm that I'm necessarily directly committing to the person either who receives the credibility excess or the person who receives the regular amount of credibility. I don't know about this. Do you agree or disagree with Fricker? Can it be bad for someone to attribute to you an excess of credibility? Fricker has trouble seeing that as a harm, but maybe we can think of scenarios in which it is a harm. And what's important here is that it has to be a harm in itself. It can't just be a harm because of its like indirect consequences. So it might be worth thinking through whether attributing to yourself or someone else attributing to you more authority than you have or more credibility than you have might be a bad thing for you as a knower and how that might be a bad thing. The other thing that's going to be important to our analysis of testimonial injustice will depend on whether or not the mistake that's being made by the hearer who's attributing the credibility, whether that mistake is an innocent mistake or an unlucky mistake, even if it's an epistemic mistake, or whether it's an actual moral wrong, right? So sometimes I, I make bad assessments of someone's credibility because I'm like thinking too quickly or I'm in a rush, like I just don't have time or I'm not being very careful, but I'm not being malicious. I, I just sort of dismiss someone when I shouldn't. And you know, if that's pointed out to me, hopefully I'll take responsibility for it. But, but what distinguishes those from a genuine moral mistake is important because the genuine moral mistake is the thing that constitutes the injustice according to Fricker. So the distinctive features that poison a mistake so as to make it culpable are prejudice. So it's fine if I make an innocent mistake and I, and I take you less seriously than I should because I'm in a bad mood today or something. But, but as long as I'm not prejudiced, it's okay. It's not like morally awful. But if I'm prejudiced towards you or people like you from your group, then that's morally bad. And I have a, a deep case of testimonial injustice that I'm committing. It might be helpful for all of us to think up and see if you can think up for our class some examples of testimonial injustice and some examples of hermeneutical injustice and to think through whether or not you think a credibility excess or a credibility deficit are unequally bad, whether or not prejudice is the only thing that makes testimonial injustice morally wrong, like is the mistake just as harmful sometimes as the, the systematic uh, prejudice. Um, and finally, let's try to think through what it is, like wh what it is about possessing a concept or not possessing a concept that can be good or bad for you in explaining your experience. For hermeneutical injustices, what is it about being able to articulate what you've been through that is good intrinsically for you as a knower? What are we missing out on as a society if we don't have concepts for important things? And can you think of a recent example of something that we've developed a concept for that we didn't have a concept for before that you think is a good concept for us to have, either because it's picking out something bad that was happening that we didn't realize, or because it's picking out something good that was happening that we couldn't express. So that's all the time we have for today. I, I hope we get a good discussion when we see each other. Um, have a lovely election day. Take care of yourselves. And I'll see you soon. Bye, everyone.